another reason why, and it's just another advantage of riding your bike to UNC Charlotte rather than driving. I got here without incident. Schwing had, had to deal with all sorts of traffic on I-85. Okay, here we are. Welcome, welcome to the last in-person lecture for hydraulics. And what I was saying was, open channel flow is referred to as gravity flow. And for you to have movement, that is, to have water moving, you have to have a slope in the surface water. Now, you can get a horizontal slope, like we have here, and as the water moves over this sharp crested weir, you get a reduction in the water depth, and that pre surface slope produces the driving force to get the water moving from left to right. hydrostatic pressure distribution on the left and right here and because there's a difference in the water depth there's a net pressure differential that provides the driving force for the flow. And this, uh, and it's proportional to that difference in water depth. So whenever the water depth changes, in this case where you have a, a horizontal slope, you'll get water moving. It's not the only situation where you can get water moving. So here we have a, a channel and the water depth is not changing, so this is what's called uniform flow, but there is slope that's not equal to zero. This is um, an exaggerated example. And so because there's no change in the water depth, there isn't the pressure component uh, driving the flow. But what we do have here is the weight of the water has a component that's in the flow direction. So if we decompose this into a, a, a component that's in the direction of the uh, in the direction that the water is moving, you'd see that there's the uh, weight of the water
drives the flow. And it is, it's possible as well to have both instances. You could have a sloping bed and you could have a change in the water depth. So there are circumstances where both processes, that is the pressure resulting from a change in water depth and the um, gravitational uh, component of the driving force, you can have instances where both things occur. All right, so um, that's all I'm gonna do in the way of an introduction. And next, what I wanted to talk about is this concept of uh, critical flow in open channels. Okay, four, four methods. One, just observations. What are the situations that produce critical flow? Next, with this concept of specific energy in an open channel. And that, actually, we're going to hold off and do next time. And I'll put it in my list here. Next, we're going to have this concept of a, a disturbance velocity. And finally, we're going to look at critical flow by uh, quantifying a non-dimensional number. All right, so uh, first, what circumstances produce critical flow? So there, there's a lot of circumstances in open channel flow when something exists that uh, chokes the flow. That is, it uh, blocks it. it uh, and the water backs up behind that, that choke point and then is released. And that's an example. That's a circumstance when through that opening you're going to get, uh, you're going to get critical flow. So some examples of that. One we've already seen flow over a weir. We've seen this one too. As you pass through the, this, the choke point, you're going to get what's referred to as critical flow.
some other circumstance from a situation with mild flow, a mild slope to steep slope. We'll, we'll find those later, but uh, you'll get this concept of critical, or this existence of critical flow. These we will talk about later, exactly how we analyze them. But in each instance, there's some sort of choking. This. Um, Another circumstance can be either This is, all of these are inside view. I, this one figure, one um, is in plan view of the channel narrowing. It can also, through that uh, narrowing, you can get uh, critical flow. And I think um, before we go on any farther, I wanted to get to the how you cal uh, calculation you can make to decide whether your flow is critical or not. So I'm going to skip next to the numerical definition. when this non-dimensional number that, that um, we may have shown you previously, but if not, I'll talk about it now. It's the ratio of fruit number is a non-dimensional number that relates the, uh, the velocity in the channel to uh, another velocity that's referred to as the disturbance velocity. I'll, I'll describe that in just a minute, but this quantification of the fruit number allows us to, to separate all open channel flow situations into three possibilities. So one is 
supercritical flow, which in general you'll get with flows that have high velocities, shallow depths, and steep bed slopes. The alternative to that is subcritical flow. Subcritical flow with low Reynolds numbers, oh, sorry, no, low Froude numbers, which from the equation you can see that will occur when the velocities are relatively low, the water depths are relatively high, and uh, as we'll see in uniform flow, it's when the bed slopes are relatively small, that is, a shallow slope. And so, uh, just a little bit more on the relationship between depth and velocity and flow rate. So imagine we've got a rectangular channel Width B, and uh, you can define, uh, we've mentioned this before, you can define the flow per unit width as the flow divided by the width. So imagine you have a channel, a long channel, and that you've got uh, Three possibilities. We have the so in these three possibilities. Each of them has the same flow per unit width occurring. But in the circumstance that the bed slope is shallow, you might get a that's the there's the bed. You might get a small depth in this case and a large depth in that case, but the same flow per unit width in all three cases. This middle case, where the fruit number is exactly one, is called a critical bed slope. And To determine the, the, the critical depth, that is the water depth that produces a fruit number of one and critical flow, as and so in that circumstance, you can say that. Why for the subcritical cases? So 
water depth is greater than the critical depth, and for this case, the water depth is less than the critical depth. Right, let's um, do an example. So here's just a, a simple example of a rectangular channel. It has depth y and is 100 feet, oops, no, it's 30 feet wide. And the water depth is four feet. We want to know what is the critical depth. Uh, and the through number when the, when the um, water depth is four feet. And solve this, the first thing you would do is calculate the flow per unit width. So there's our flow per unit width. And next, now that we know that, we can calculate critical depth, that is the, the flow in this particular channel with this particular flow rate, I mean the depth in this particular channel with this particular flow rate that gives critical flow, that is the root number of one, I think I have it. Okay. What do you have? Point seven zero zero nine. Okay. Yeah. That's what I got. Point seven zero one. All right. So what that means is.
any cases with uh, depths more than 0.7 feet, it's subcritical. Any cases with depths less than is supercritical. Water depth of four is definitely subcritical, and let's confirm that by calculating the brood number. Let me give that brood number definition one more time. I don't know if I explain what we've got in the denominator here. We've got a special water depth that's called the hydraulic depth. What's the hydraulic depth? Just say it takes some um, natural channel. cross-sectional area divided by the top width. Let's do a couple of the engineered channel cases. So a rectangular yielder channel with width B and depth H. top width the hydraulic depth is equal to the let's um, take a circular channel as you can see in a, in a circular channel of various fullnesses, you can see that it's complicated to get either the area or the top width. Let's just do one that's half full what they call uh, this uh, center line depth, D. So that if it's half full, then the area is half what it would be if it were full. And the top width will just be the diameter. So in that case, it's um, I B over H. And when it's full, I 
edge, right? So let's see, pi d squared over four over pi d, right? Doing this in my head. Uh, oh, top width, hmm, not defined. There is no top width. Hmm, so let's not go there. Yeah, I'm calculating the hydraulic radius, which is, um, that's the wetted perimeter. We want the top width, so for now let's just stick with the uh, circular channel half full, we can get this value for the hydraulic depth. Okay, so for our case where we have a rectangular channel, which is just Q divided by the width divided by the water depth, Q over A. And in the denominator, Point oh seven three four. Point oh seven three four. And that fits with what we found earlier by calculating the critical depth and comparing our depth to that. Since uh, our depth four feet is greater than the critical depth point seven feet, we know it's subcritical, and that means we know our free number should be less than one. So that all, all works with what uh, we had calculated earlier. All right, so those that's three of the four, well, two, and we're skipping one. The last thing to think about is um, describing critical flow is with this idea of a disturbance velocity. such a thing as a, a gravity wave. So a, a, a small wave on the surface of an open channel is referred to as a gravity wave and it will move at a particular speed that we call the gravity wave speed. Sometimes called the wave celerity. Equation 10.3 from the text, and this is talked about in section 
of the text. And uh, the way of thinking of this is, I don't know, we've all thrown rocks in a pond, I hope. So imagine, you take a rock, and you throw it into a, a pond. It generates a, a disturbance about the location where the rock hits the pond. These so they move out from the point where the rock enters the pond at a wave speed C. And so you, I'm sure, seen zero, the location of the disturbance is here, and these are the, the ripples these are uh, the ripples that move outward from the point where the the rock entered the disturbances are moving out at a speed times the water depth. All right, so let's, let's um, see what this means to flow in a channel. shallow slope with subcritical flow that is um, well, that is so there's a, a V the water is moving downstream from left to right at a speed V and V is less than the disturbance velocity speed. Okay, so in this case, imagine you, you threw a rock, not in the pond, but in a channel. superimposed upon it, there's a disturbance on the water surface that's moving as the water moves relative to the 
to that uh, where the that water particle was when the, the rock entered. So that disturbance is moving downstream at uh, the, the uh, channel velocity plus the disturbance velocity. And then what you'll see is that there's also, these are called um, characteristics. There's also a characteristic motion that happens upstream. Uh, at um, it's moving upstream. Oops, minus. It's moving down relative to uh, the moving frame of reference, the, this um, disturbance is moving upstream at the disturbance velocity, but at the same time, the water is moving downstream. So it's like, um, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, one of my favorite things to do was, um, when mom wasn't watching at the mall, we would run up and down escalators that was and um, so I think of it that way is that uh, the disturbance velocity was me and my two little brothers running up the escalator and the, um, the water velocity is the escalator moving down and depending on the speed that that escalator moved uh, or the speed that I moved you could either um, go up, up the down escalator or not. Uh, and that's different than, so in this case we've got V is less than that disturbance velocity. In the case of a steep slope, The, um, in a steep slope, the characteristics only move downstream. So there's um, no upstream characteristic. And the reason that is, is that you can think of the, when that disturbance is made in the, at this location, it, it moves upstream, but it's moving downstream faster than it's moving upstream. And what that means is that uh, the disturbance that moves out is moving downstream. Let me do that. So if we put the, disturbance right here at time zero, you get the disturbance moving in both directions, but both of those, I mean it, but those are both downstream, whereas in this one, the disturbances are able to move, I'm trying to make, they move um, both upstream and downstream. So in this is the case of um, subcritical flow. This is the case of supercritical flow. And because of that, there's a fundamental difference in the way these two systems operate in terms of um, the, what's controlling the water depth at a particular location. This is referred to as um, so by the way, what we mean by downstream control 
if something is changed downstream, those effects are felt upstream because that change that's made, say that the, the stream suddenly gets um, blocked, like a, a, say um, the big rain that we had a week ago, you can see in some of the culverts, they are completely, or, or they're partially filled with um, debris. And at that location, there's a, there's a new obstruction. And that new obstruction will disturb the conditions upstream if the flow leading up to that uh, culvert was uh, subcritical. On the other hand, if it's a steeply sloping um, channel leading up to the culvert, and there's some uh, constriction of the flow through the culvert, you won't have um, an effect that felt upstream of that constriction. That's what's referred to as upstream control. Okay, and that's this idea of uh, different ways of characterizing critical flow, and uh, that's where we're gonna leave it today.